It's your weekly dose of confessions. Coming up, a bit of this. How hard is she tugging this toilet roll for it to start flying off? And some of this. They I'm should, Simon Mayo and should, I demand excuse, another towel. Don't they you should have run why, down. Why can't they ring down? They need them. This is a download from the BBC. To find out more, including our terms of use, go to bbc.co.uk slash radio 2. Hello and welcome to our Confessions podcast. This week's concise collection of terrible tales include a sizeable stag beetle, an untimely obituary announcement, a delicious doppelganger, and a towel thief who gets her comeuppance. Here it all comes. So here's tonight's confession. Thank you very much indeed uh, for these. Do it online, send us an email. Tonight's comes from Lamo. Thank you, Lamo. Now, the only Lamo I know is Steve Lamac. Steve Lamac. Well, it could be. Well, he could be confessing. You, well, we'll, we'll know at the end. Well, let's see, shall we? Dear Father Simon, brothers and sisters, having recently had a good chuckle at the tarantula fueled shed burning fireman and painted tortoise confession, let's not go into all that again, Sister Rebecca. Lamo <laughs> no, writes. let's not. Thank you. <laughs> a somewhat repressed memory was stirred that took me back to an event that occurred in the late 70s when I was aged about 12. One of the highlights of early summer evenings for me and my brother was a remarkable abundance of stag beetles that would appear crawling up trees and flying around our garden and up and down our street. As the night drew in... (laughs) These these beetles were typing, were they? (laughs) That's right. Is that what they're doing? Very, very useful, (laughs) actually. Can you tell me what it looks like? What, this one particular? Yeah. It's a stag beetle. <laughs> There's tap dancing. <laughs> what, is, what is that thing doing? I... <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Labo says, we would amuse ourselves. There's more details to come as, uh, as the story progresses. We would amuse ourselves by catching said stag beetles in fishing nets and putting them in a big box to see how many we would catch. Well, lots was the answer, but we would always let them go unharmed at the end of our evening's fun. We soon wondered if we could catch the same beetles night after night, so we put a spot of white paint on their backs. Sure enough, we'd often catch the same ones on different days. This was all harmless fun and undoubtedly aided the subsequent population of stag beetles by unintentionally providing a sort of beetle dating agency in our cardboard box. (laughs) That's ridiculous. Oh, That's the bit where the little yeah. wings. The little is, wings. Is that the Bruce Forsyth yeah. bit at the end? So, yeah. can, sorry, can I just? So this is a stag beetle that can fly. Is that right? You're already I don't beyond think my. They can fly. They might have little wings. Do they? I don't know. It's a big one. Rebecca says they can't fly. <laughs> However, one day I came across a dead. I've missed that a bit. This was all harmless fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is going very well. And I deadly aided the subsequent population of stag beetles by unintentionally providing a sort of beetle dating agency in our cardboard box. It also probably saved some of them from the local bats, for which the stag beetles were something of a delicacy. However, one day I came across a dead but perfectly intact and rather impressive male specimen, about two inches long and with really big pinchers, as we called them, mandibles to you and me. Obviously this had to be kept, so into my pocket it went. At around this time, my mother ran the local Sunday school and we were dutifully dragged along to church every Sunday morning and then on for some wishy-washy orange squash in the church hall afterwards. Picture, if you will, a large church hall with an entrance lobby and ladies and gentlemen's loos on either side. After a pious morning and copious quantities of squash, I was attending a call of nature in the gents' loo when I found I still had the stag beetle in my pocket. And then it occurred to me, wouldn't the stag beetle look great peeping over the top of the loo roll? (laughs) Well, the answer was, it did. So I left it there. I went back to scrounge some biscuits. Time passed, and I forgot about my beetle, which, remember, is two inches along and dead. During the week, the church hall was used by a preschool playgroup, and the following chain of events was described to me by my mother uh, from someone in the playgroup who might just have had an inkling as to who was responsible. It turned out that at some point during the morning, one of the lady playgroup teachers took a number of the boys to the toilet for a wee. 
Once they had finished, she apparently stayed behind to use the facilities herself. She then pulled on the loo roll, and my prize specimen stag beetle leapt out at her in a very lifelike fashion and locked in her hair. <laughs> What? She is then rumoured to have screamed and fled from the loo with her pants around her oh, ankles. What? Dear, dear. So whilst the me- I love that dear dear, it's very good. <laughs> so whilst the memory still fills me with mirth, I do feel remorse and ask the confessional collective for forgiveness, not only for causing shock and embarrassment to the playgroup teacher, who shouldn't really have been using the gents loo anyway, but also for the potential mental scars inflicted on the playgroup children by seeing their teacher screaming and improperly clad. And for that I am truly sorry. It's Lama. It could be Steve Lamac. I suspect that probably is Steve Lamac. We should have a special six music series uh, of this. What do you think, uh, Sister Rebecca? Well, you would have thought that a schoolboy, a 12-year-old boy who, did, who, who arranged that prank and orchestrated the whole thing, it would have been fantastic for him to have the result of it catching someone's hair and then running around out of the loo trouserless. And yet he felt remorse. So what was his intention? I don't know. Well, he I mean, didn't, he, he didn't... wanted to scare somebody and that's what he achieved. He so I just think... don't get why he did it. So I think that uh, there could never have been a good outcome in this whole scenario. You don't understand boys. I, no, I don't understand boys at all. Uh, maybe she shouldn't have gone to the loo in the boys' loo, but uh, still I am not going to forgive you. No, no, no. Uh, Mother Superior, what do you think? Well, I've just been given a picture by a lovely producer, Mark, of what a stag beetle looks like. It's a pretty horrible looking thing, particularly when it's flying. Um, that's it. That's it, <laughs> flying at the end. Yes. I, now, hang on a bit. I'm confused. Though. I thought you said it was dead, so how come it re- was resurrected somehow? Well, when he put it on the loo roll, you yeah. said he was dead. That's right. She pulled the loo roll and it flew up. Oh, I see. It didn't actually fly like an alive thing. It, it was dead, but it kind of just leapt out at her. Correct. Oh, OK, I've got that now. Well, in that case, I'm going to forgive you <laughs> because if it had been an alive one and it would have really scared and it would have probably done worse no, things. It but it, if it was dead... What worse um, things would it have done, do you think? Um, Got well, drunk, it, she's in the told loo. Lies. Um, and if it had been me, I probably would have done something worse than just drop my pants. I would have done something in my pants. But anyway, so I'm going. To, I am actually. Oh, good. Well, well, I'm moving on now. No, but I'm, I'm just sorry. I'm sorry. Everyone's now. I'd like to apologise for that last remark. I'm going to say uh, I forgive you. Know you. that lovely producer Mark you were yes. talking about. He's got something he just wants he's, to say to you in the moment. Sacked. Um, no, I'm sorry. I just would say I'd like to. I, I will forgive you definitely. Good. Definitely. But we're not forgiving you, uh, brother. Brother Matt. Matthew. Right. Uh, number one, what's she doing having uh, a going to the loo in the boys' loo? She's taking boys' number to the Number one, right. Take, no. shouldn't, have done, shouldn't have gone into the ladies' loo. Not, shouldn't have been in the men's loo in the first place. Number two, uh, how hard is she tugging this toilet roll for it to start flying off? Well, and, into her to... and what's she doing leaning down by the, by the toilet roll there anyway? That's what I want to know. The, none of these things are explained, <laughs> frankly. And for that reason, uh, he has nothing to be forgiven for. Oh, Lamo. Yeah, Lamo gets away scot free. Rebecca, you haven't had your Jubilee haircut yet? Uh, Friday. It's booked for Friday. Is it going to be before the show or...? Yes. Excellent. So we can. So you're going to come in looking like Her Majesty on Friday. I hope Friday. so. That'll be very. That'll be very good. <laughs> I think you should put a Union Jack. Put some colour. Union Jack colour. Red and blue and white. Why don't you do that? That's a good idea, Sal. Or just Not. get a tattoo. Across your forehead. Thanks. For God all, bless your mum. All your suggestions, most welcome. <laughs> Tonight's confession is, uh, I think this is, uh, it's a great story from Helen. Thank you very much. A very cinematic tale that we have here from Helen. Dear Father Simon and the Assorted Collective. It is with a heavy heart and a profound sense of guilt that I write this confession and fall at your mercy and plead for forgiveness. Picture the scene. We are in Chad, a poor and volatile nation west of Sudan, and the sanctuary for hundreds of thousands of refugees. The year is 2006, and I was a 30-something humanitarian worker, living in a hut, managing a team of dedicated and honourable staff who ensured that even in the harsh and arid conditions of sub-Saharan Africa, essential services were provided not only to the refugees, but also to the local communities, all of whom were almost totally dependent on, on us for their survival. Now, 2006 was a difficult year. The temperatures were in the region of 50 degrees centigrade. And we were working on a knife edge, hot, tired, and desperate for a cold beer. 
On a particular day in question, I was travelling the gruelling four hours across the rocky desert and sandy tracks from my base, close to the Sudan border, to our central office in Abeshe. There were a number of local staff in the 4x4 that day, and we were in high spirits, looking forward to a short and well-deserved break in an office where electricity was regular and office fans were abundant. Security reports were good and the road was clear, so for once, as senior staff member in the car, I suggested that maybe we could have some music to listen to rather than just scanning the two-way radio for news of trouble. As it happened, before leaving home I'd purchased a contraption for transmitting my MP3 player through the car radio system. So I asked the team what music they'd like to hear. Bob Marley was the immediate and expected reply, as Bob Marley is always popular in Africa, and I'd made a point of putting some of his albums on my MP3 player for that very reason. So I duly located the Legend album and proceeded to transmit it throughout the vehicle through the dust-filled speakers. We spent a happy half hour singing along to the tracks and swaying in time to the music. At the end of the album, I turned to the driver and innocently said, It's so sad that Bob Marley died. He's dead, said the driver, screeching the car to a halt in the middle of the desert. Well, yes, I replied, somewhat surprised at his reaction. How? When? he cried. I proceeded to tell him it was about 20 years ago. The driver turned to the somewhat shocked team who'd been thrown somewhat unceremoniously across the bench seats of the car during our unexpected halt. Did you hear that? Bob Marley is dead. What? cried the team. He's dead? Yes, the boss has just told me. He died over 20 years ago. Next, the driver grabbed the two-way radio and called our office. Bob Marley is dead! And over the next hour or so, the radio waves resounded to the news of Bob Marley's sad demise. Clearly, with Chad being somewhat outside the normal news networks, particularly in the 1980s, when the dearly departed St. Marley passed away, it appears that news of the death of the great man had never reached these distant sandy reaches. Well, by the time we arrived at our main base, it seems that the entire area was finally aware of the passing of the late great man a little later than the rest of the world may be, but late nonetheless. The whole area was aware of the news. Now, Chad is a mainly Muslim country, and it's traditional that when someone dies, those who know and respect the dearly departed will go into mourning for three days, and very little is done other than pray whilst people pay their respects. Being a Westerner, although I'd appreciated that communication was limited in this country, little did I realise what a profound effect this flippant and unnecessary throwaway comment would have. The area ground to a total halt for three days of mourning. Not only were my team affected, but quickly news spread throughout the country, and work was reduced to a snail's pace or totally abandoned for the duration. For this foolish error of judgment, I would like to ask forgiveness from the collective and apologise for all those people who not only found out that their hero was not living in quiet retirement on a Jamaican island, but had actually departed this mortal coil a few decades before and were now thrust into a somewhat belated mourning. I would also ask forgiveness from any people in Chad who found that they were unable to access certain services, as I believe that many shops closed as a mark of respect and had to wait a little longer for life's essentials. In my shallow defence, I would like to point out that the long-awaited and anticipated purchase of a crate of cold beer, which I've been dreaming of in the harsh and relentless heat of the desert, proved to be somewhat impossible. So myself and my Western colleagues also suffered the effects of my stupidity. I await the kind forgiveness of the team and hope with all my heart that they are able to appreciate my innocence. Well, you have to say it's a pretty astonishing story. Uh, I mean, you would say that, wouldn't you? He'd been dead a long time. You'd just say he's sad he died. All of a sudden, half the country shuts for three days and you can't get a beer. What do you it think? It is Sister an astonishing Rebecca? story, but it doesn't surprise me at all. I remember going on holiday to Zanzibar and they were obsessed by Bob Marley. They used to play it the whole time, morning and night. That's all they listened to. So I'm, I imagine exactly the same thing would have happened there. I never tested the water. Aren't you half Zimba uh, no. Zanzibarian? <laughs> no, I'm nothing. To, I'm... Just a holiday. Okay. Um, but, you know, Helen wasn't to know that these guys weren't aware that he died many years before. And in a way, you could argue that uh, it's better that they 
did find out at some point, you know, even if it was from her lips and not from the news broadcasts. So I think, you know, it is a shame that the whole country closed down for a while, but they were going to find out sometime. It would have happened sometime, Helen. So you are totally forgiven. And she's a humanitarian worker. She's doing a lot of uh, good work. Well, I was going to say, yes, this wonderful woman, Helen, goes over to to help some, you know, people out. And uh, accidentally, this comes out. Well, you know, I, I don't understand why they wouldn't have known. I mean, you can get the television there. You can get movies. He's there. dead. He's yeah, it's amazing. You can imagine in the, in the middle of a desert. It is like something from a from a movie or from a TV show. Yeah, I, you would have felt. I understand you would have felt awful, Helen. But I don't think you've got anything to to feel guilty about. And as far as I'm concerned, you're totally forgiven. But you never know what Brother Matthew's going to say, do you? You've got to ask questions about the news channels in Chad, really, haven't you? I mean, if they haven't picked up on this and it's twenty years ago and just still nothing's come out, no. Someone needs to start pulling their finger out. Um, I, Helen's got nothing. This is an amazing story an amazing story that so few people knew of that and and then suddenly the the repercussions from one comment in a car one comment and half the country absolutely closes. amazing story uh, definitely forgiven well done Helen. <laughs> An exam fun to be had <laughs> revision it'll drive us all crazy <clears throat> sorry in my head in. So here we go with uh, tonight's confession, and you're very, very well. You sound welcome. like a teenager. I know, I feel like a I can't take it anymore. It's drama tomorrow. Drama A level. Really? Yeah. That's you every day, though, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it is. How oh, you, yeah. How do, you, how do you revise for drama, though? Do you just go off and, and read the speech from Hamlet, or what do you do? You study the texts, you study plays. And you have to perform them? Uh, there is a practical side to it. Oh. Uh, yeah. I could tell you all about A View from the Bridge, if you like. That's a bit kind of advanced. How old? A-level. Oh, <laughs> all right, sorry. I thought they were 12. Uh, <laughs> just, you blink and they grow up. How does that happen? <laughs> Look, the music is running. Here's tonight's tale, uh, which comes from a humble listener. Yes. Father Simon, your lovely collective, for a number of months since becoming aware of your programme, my eldest son has hijacked my radio to listen to the assorted confessions and adjudications of your good self and your venerable colleagues. Quite apart from the interruption of my daily intake of news and current affairs, the journey home has become an almost daily reminder of a misdemeanour that occurred many years ago, and I thought had been cast into the rivers of time. Listening to other listeners' confessions has been like a constant tugging at my inner consciousness to the extent that I now feel compelled to seek your forgiveness. During the 1980s and early 90s, I regularly attended the Greenbelt Festival at its former venue of Castle Ashby in Northamptonshire. Amongst the unnatural melee of tents, long drop loos and randomly distributed mud, there grew in some of my fellow campers a natural urge to seek refuge in more comfortable surroundings. Some resorted to caravans, others sought refuge in nearby towns and travelled in daily. Available to a select few was the only alternative that Surrey dwelling softies like our family could abide, namely the only public house for many miles around, the Spread Eagle. This oasis of calm, quiet and cleanliness, cleanliness sported just a handful of double rooms. It was such an attraction that it was not long before I persuaded my parents to abandon all hope of campsite hygiene and take up lodgings in said hostelry. Despite there being many thousands of festival goers, a few strings were pulled and a small double room was secured for the duration of the festival. Now it came to pass that in one particular year, I forget which, the filth was greater than normal and it was deemed necessary by those around me, principally my tent buddy, that a wash was called for. Taking his advice, I took myself off to the Spread Eagle and indulged in a shower courtesy of my parents' lodgings. I felt like a new person and was ready to face festival life again. Word soon spread that this facility might be available to non-residents and soon a steady stream of friends, friends of friends, people we'd just met, well, you know, you get the picture, all coming in for a shower. I became quite adept at confidently striding through the bar and reception area towards the bedroom accommodation with batches of four, five or six smelly campers. Some offered payment in the form of cookies, coffee, burgers, that kind of thing. Soon, I didn't need to pay for any food at all. All was going well. However, I was overlooking that a room intended for occupation by just two persons has one seriously limiting factor. Uh, yes, on this occasion for which I seek forgiveness, whilst waiting in the bedroom for my turn in the shower and tucking into some recently acquired mud money, I heard a cry for help from inside the bathroom. Fresh towels were required. Everything 
was soaking and soggy. We needed just one dry, lovely towel. But where could they be found? I opened drawers, the wardrobe. I looked under the bed. No fresh towels could be found anywhere. In desperation, I opened the bedroom door and peered out into the corridor. There, outside the door of the neighbouring room, was a small pile of fresh, laundered towels. I was saved. Without a second thought, I picked up the towels and took them inside, along with the soap and some miniatures. In itself, I have to say, this is a small and almost meaningless act. After all, who would miss some towels? Whose need could be greater than my own? And rather than leave the occupants of that neighbouring room entirely without towels, I deposited a couple of very wet, rather smelly ones in place of the clean ones. It was a couple of days later as we prepared to leave Castle Ashby that my father happened to mention that in the room next to theirs was a couple with a young child. A bit of a screamer, I seem to recall him saying, with the voice of someone who hadn't had much sleep. He asked if I'd ever heard of the man in the room next door. Strange name, I think. Something like Halo? Mayo, that's it, it was... <laughs> Mayo, I think yeah. it's... So you see, Father Simon, I seek forgiveness for a small matter that may have been inconsequential to many, but was perpetrated against your good self and your young family in the name of personal betterment. I realise now that this was a selfish thing to do, and with the added hindsight of suffering sleepless nights with young offspring, I would understand if a few choice words passed your lips when seeing our pile of damp towels outside your room. Mm -hmm. My only hope is that the lack of clean towels, and most probably hot water too, went largely unnoticed. I am relieved that sleep and cleanliness deprivation evidently did not lead to a career-halting error, the mere thought of which makes me cringe as I write. I am fully repentant and have never since deliberately removed toweling, bedding, soap or anything else destined for another person's hotel room. But I shall accept your judgment and whatever penance you serve upon me. Well, you know, Simon, you've got to make a judgment on yeah, this tonight absolutely. as well as yeah. us. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do All you right. remember this incident? Do I remember having to dry my family with a flannel? <laughs> oh, yeah. Is that what you mean? And then when the flannel got a little bit wet using the duvet? Seriously. Is that what you mean? Well, why don't you just send down for another towel? Just, I, I need Probably another sure. towel. Well, how long, yeah, but how long is that going to take? we know where the judgment's going. And how long yeah. is that going to take, do Somebody's you think? Somebody's own fault. <laughs> Hello, is that room service? Can you send up at how, 40 minutes? Oh. It's a hotel, and you, I want another towel. Yeah, you might as well just use the duvet. <laughs> just go and roll in the duvet, son. I'm sure it'll be fine. Yeah, I think Matt's onto something here. But first of all, the uh, the perpetrator, um, did she really need to take all the towels? I mean, that was a bit selfish. She could have just taken maybe one, you know, or two, but not... All the towels. All of my towels. All of I your towels. And saying. also, she was being a bit naughty by letting all and sundry use her parents' room when they'd only paid for one couple. There to were use clearly the room. scores of people going in exactly. next door. Exactly, and she was benefiting from it. She wasn't giving the hotel owners any of the money that she was being given. So obviously, you're really angry about it. She didn't need to take all the towels. Um, in a way, she's paid her penance because uh, she was being kept. Her parents were being kept away by your child. I think your I could children. probably. I think I could probably sue this person. <laughs> As a, a breach for of towel theft. A breach of human rights. Yeah. I'm sure it's covered by actually, the European, European Court. Yeah. <laughs> I'm anyway, sure if I look I'll, deeply into it, I think if I were you, I would be pretty annoyed. But I think you kept her parents away, so you're forgiven. What do you think, Mother Superior? Oh, well, you know, this Simon, is next I'm to very, very protective about you and your family, and I think this is appalling, absolutely appalling. However, however, having said there that... There is no however. No. There's if, no however. If it had been me and I would have been in that hotel, I would have been on that blower and saying, what do you call this? I've been... Have two wet flannelly towels deposited in my room. Yes. Can you please sort it out? Why didn't you do that? Because I'd have got because no idea. What? <laughs> because you are entitled to. I go don't want to make a fuss. But, you're, in, um... you're entitled to go into the bathroom and expect there to be a towel there. Yeah, but if there isn't, <laughs> I, you know, I've, I've been in hotel rooms before when the sink is cracked or something's missing, and I've immediately phoned down and said, "Can you please fix?" We this? probably did that, and they probably said it'll be an hour or two. I, don't know. I can't remember. Well, if you can't remember, it can't have been that traumatic. It was traumatic, and I am going to sue. <laughs> okay, Definitely. well, I don't know what to do because, I mean, I really like you and I love your family, and the fact that you, you know, didn't have towels is horrific to me. Yes. However, you were a bit of a plonker. <laughs> 
Fair enough. Well argued. Yeah, uh, I'm going to go along with that. Uh, you should have phoned down to reception. And, uh, you know, it is wrong to get people into you. But, but frankly, let he who has never sneaked someone into their hotel room cast the first Yeah, but two. she took, like, scores We've all of done people. It. Like, the, the yeah, well, entire yeah, to campsite. be honest, once you've done the first five, the number's immaterial. It doesn't, doesn't really matter anymore. And, uh, yes, you should definitely have rung down and said, G- just give me another towel. No. I just want another towel. I'm should, Simon Mayo and should, I demand another me, towel. Don't they you should have rung down. Down. Why can't they ring down? They, they need them. Why should they need them? Because then they'd have found that there was somebody in the room who shouldn't have been in the room. You should have been on the blower. So it's my fault. Yes, it's your fault entirely. You're definitely Are you not sure forgiven. you did not ring down because you were flatting the rules yourself in some way? It's ah, not... now we're getting to yeah, the crux of it. You didn't oh, yeah. No, I'll take you out. <laughs> Patty sends in tonight's tale. Thank you, Patty, dear Father Simon, Mother Superior, brothers and sisters of the cloth. Begging for your forgiveness as for 15 years my best friend and I have had a guilty secret. It's my secret. 15 years ago, about the time when Claire Grogan was in EastEnders, everyone was telling me how much I looked like her. I was delighted to hear this, as she is very beautiful. And I, frankly, says Patty, am not. I thought the only thing I had in common with Claire was that we're both born on St Patrick's Day, we're both Scottish, and we have the same hairstyle. As far as I was concerned, that's where the similarities ended. One freezing rainy night, my pal and I were standing in a very long queue for a nightclub in Edinburgh, when people started saying, you look like Gregory's girl, you do. Sorry, that's not a really very good Edinburgh (laughs) Hello, hello, hello. (laughs) Yeah. It's caught me again. (laughs) My pal jokingly said, shh, don't, it's Claire, she... She doesn't like to keep it quiet. Anyway, five minutes later, a bouncer came over and asked us to follow him. It was so cold, we shrugged and followed. We were escorted right into the VIP area of the club and given a bottle of cheap plonk. At this point, we didn't know what was going on, but overheard the bouncer saying, That's Claire Grogan, that is. The two of us creased up laughing at this and couldn't believe that people would be so daft as to think I really was the real Claire Grogan. To be honest, we were just glad to be out of the cold, never mind the free club entry and the free champagne. We thought that was that. However, with Patrick and Andy's blasting out loudly, we got carried away. So after downing the wine and feeling merry, our dancing feet took over and we were definitely up for a boogie around our handbags. The DJ then did what all DJs do and announced over the song to everyone, we've got a star in the house. That's not a very good DJ voice. You'd think I could do a DJ <laughs> voice. Really. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we have a DJ, we have a star, that's what we have. Could they give a very big warm welcome, please, to the one and only Claire Grogan, pointing right at me. I grabbed my pal's hand repeating, oh, bother, this isn't good. By this time, everyone was surrounding me and chanting, Claire, Claire, Claire. I panicked as some crazed fan pushed me onto the stage. I was sending eye signals to my pal, asking her to pull me back, saying, I'm never going to get away with this. I was trying to backtrack and wriggle my way off the stage, but knew ultimately I was going to have to face the music, as the clubbers clearly wanted Claire, Claire. In my fear, stupidity and embarrassment, and I don't know where it came from, I grabbed the DJ's microphone out of his hand and burst into a montage of the one altered images song that I knew. And I kept repeating the same lines. Happy birthday, happy birth... Over and over. I carried on. Happy birthday! Dancing stupidly on stage at the same time and trying to hide the fact that I couldn't sing and didn't know any other words. I was sure I'd be unceremoniously booted off the stage, but the audience were cheering and clapping, probably due to the happy hour having just ended, giving me the much-needed confidence that I needed to sing in a club full of people. When I eventually came off the stage, I was getting guys coming up to me saying, I fancied you when I was a boy. Can I have your autograph, Claire? I have to say I signed Claire Grogan at least 20 times. The telltale, the giveaway, was I spelt Claire wrong. She's A-R-E, not A-I-R-E, that I wrote. Oh, dear. I can see why some famous people, Simon, get a big head, as my one and a half minutes of fame really went to my head and I thoroughly enjoyed the attention. I even got them to sneak me out the back door when I was leaving. My pal and I spoke about it for weeks afterwards. But I would like to take the opportunity to apologise to everyone in the club, especially to the bouncer who gave us free entry and a bottle of champagne, to the DJ for having me up on stage, and for all the men that thought they fancied me in their youth, some of whom I kissed. See, there you go. I see. 
Well, are you Claire <laughs> oh, Krogan? This is all very uh, pious, that, wasn't it? Are you Claire Krogan? Did she say some of whom? I fancied yeah. you. Give us a kiss. It was just a laugh spiralled out of control, but in my defence, I never actually said I was Claire Grogan, so it's really their fault, isn't it? Come on, Collective, agree with me. Says Patty, who, you can tell, looks an awful lot like Claire Grogan. What do you say, Sister Rebecca? I don't think it's very nice of these men to go up and say, I fancied, in the past tense, you when I was a boy. I.e., yeah. you're no longer attractive, but yeah. I'll kiss you anyway. I fancied... Uh, yeah. yeah, that's right. It definitely said fancied past tense. Yeah, I think... Um, I don't think Claire Grogan would have been very happy about this, necessarily. I don't think so. Especially if this woman, Patty, couldn't sing. I mean, if she sang really badly, then people would think, oh, Claire Grogan really can't sing. And only knew Happy Birthday. <laughs> only knew, birthday, because I didn't know the words to any birthday. of her songs, yeah. exactly. So I think she probably owes Claire an apology, rather than the men that she, um, you know, had dalliances with in the club. Yeah. So I think for that reason, I mean, she's totally forgiven for the men bit, but not for the Claire Grogan bit. OK, Mother Superior. See, I love these mistaken identity stories. And my take on it is, if somebody thinks you're somebody famous and you get an advantage for that, then take it. I mean, I would, wouldn't you? Oh, mind you, you are somebody famous. No, no. <laughs> I, 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 I was one... I forgot. <laughs> Many years... <laughs> who are you? Yes, who are you again? I, I did a book signing years and years and years ago. Yeah. And, this guy, and there was a, a small queue of people. <laughs> and this guy came up and said, are you a bloke from the bill? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll sign it. Fine. Yeah. So you just so you just have to, people. There's a great song by Loudon Wainwright called Harry's Wall, and it's basically about the laundrette round the corner. It's got photographs of famous people, and I think the chorus is something like, "There's, there's Chaz and Dave, the three degrees, and me." And everyone has got a shop round near them which has got photographs of famous people there, and there it is, and it's Chaz and Dave for three degrees in here. Well, the thing is, you're very recognisable, but, I mean, I suspect that, that Matt and Rebecca and I are not necessarily recognisable when we go out. Although people... I, I remember buying something once, and someone and I said, yes, I'll just sign it here, and they said, I know your voice, and that's the only time it's ever happened to me. But I think if I was mistaken for Madonna, say, think people think which is obviously quite likely... Catherine Deneuve, people might think you're... Yeah, <laughs> whoever, and, they, and I got stuff out of, out of that mistake which is theirs and not mine then I would take full advantage of it so in my book you're totally forgiven Brother Matt, are you ever stopped? Uh, no, say, never. Are you that bloke? No, 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 I'm not. No, I'm someone else. Um, I, I think this crowd sounds a bit weird, to be honest. <laughs> it sounds surrounding by people and going, Claire, Claire, yeah, that's what? what she said. Claire, 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 Claire. <laughs> yeah. What are they? What are they doing? Um, I absolutely right. Get it, get any kind of advantage you can out of people who think that you're someone you're not. And if that involves a few kisses from a you, a few gentlemen in the it's club, an advantage. Then, then indeed, uh, go 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 for it. Um, and and you spelled her name wrong and couldn't sing. But yes, they, what a what a bizarre bunch of people. It doesn't there really were. sound as though there's anything really that would make you think it was Claire Grogan. No. And that's your lot for this week. More in a fortnight, Friday the 15th of June, as always. Thank you for listening.